What's up, gangsters? If you follow any of my nonsense, you may know that, uh, let's see, about five months ago, it's mid-November 2024 right now, so middle of June, I started on this thing right here, the Kotare 132nd Scale Spitfire Mark 1A Mid. And I made a couple of videos about it. Um, I normally do uh, two videos in my sort of build review things, but I did an intermediate one because there was just a lot to talk about with this kit, uh, which is wonderful. And anyway, finally, I am at that point that I love to be at, which is done. Yeah, finally. Uh, this has been... Um, a really fun little project. Uh, the kit has been absolutely fantastic. Not perfect, but really, really good. And um, yeah, I'm stoked that I chose to build it. And I also mentioned several times along the way that there was something in particular that actually got me to do it. I'd been wanting to build this thing for a long time, but I was, you know, like, well, I don't want to build yet another green and brown uh, airplane or green and gray, you know, whichever it was going to be. And I needed to find a Spitfire that had a color scheme that really got me excited. And that happened. And that's why I decided to go ahead and build this thing. So uh, here's what it is. I was uh, surfing ye olde internet one day and I saw uh, this picture right here. This is of Spitfire AR-213, and this is in about uh, July-ish, uh, well, July, some, sometime between July of 1941 and February of 1943. And this aircraft, uh, it was built by Westland. It was one of the last, bat of the, it was part of one of the last batches of Mark 1A that were built. And it was delivered directly to 57 OTU, that's Operational Training Unit, in July of 1941. And it got this super cool and honestly kind of goofy paint job on the nose. And the reason is because um, it was designated as a bogey, as a bounce aircraft. Um, an aircraft that was used to haze pilots in training. And as it happens, this particular one was flown quite a bit by Ginger Lacey. If you are at all a student of RAF World War II history, you probably know that Lacey was pretty famous. He was an ace. He finished up the war with 28 kills and some probables and some ground targets destroyed. And he was one of very few British pilots who was active both on the day the war started and the day the war ended. So, and it was pretty traditional, I guess, while they were, you know, maybe recovering from an injury or whatever, that they would have to do some temporary duty at one of these operational training units. And basically their job was to fuck with the junior pilots. And so he flew this particular aircraft quite a bit. So that's pretty cool. What's also cool about this airplane is that it survived the war. Um, these are the only pictures I know of that exist of this aircraft. Um, there allegedly are some pictures of it when it got taken out of a crate in 1963, but I've never been able to find those. At any rate, it did survive the war. It was a gate guard for a little while. It got used in the Battle of Britain movie. It was, I guess... Uh, painted up and made up to look like a, a Mark 5B. And then it went on to get restored several times and actually still flies to this day. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, I, I just, I love that it was exactly the right thing and I had to do it. Now, um, there is a bit of controversy though. I think I may have mentioned that a couple of times along the way. And that is, first of all, when you look at these black and white photos, there's no way to tell what color those stripes actually are. They are believed and widely depicted to be red, white, and blue. 
just kind of based on comparison of the tones that we know, like in the insignia, it's not a bad guess, but that's all it is. It's a guess. And there's question about what color the aircraft actually is. Is it um, dark earth and green, or is it ocean gray and green? You'll see it depicted on decal color sheets in both patterns. I, you know, I don't know. I personally believe that when you look at this first photo of it, which was before the nose got painted, that it probably was tan and green because they were still delivering aircraft using that color scheme in July of 1941. My understanding is that they didn't give the order to switch to gray and green until later in the fall of 1941. And I personally think that it's unlikely that an aircraft in an operational training unit would have been very high on the list of priority to get repainted. So, yeah, you'll see what I went with. I also think that when you look at the photos, that, you know, based on details with the camouflage, where it's exactly the same in all three pictures, I really believe that at least for the 18 months that it was with 5702U, OTU, that it probably stayed the same colors, uh, whatever they were. Um, now, after it got moved to a different operational training unit in 1943, who knows? Never seen any pictures of it after that point. But I made my decision. I, you know, I think it would have looked pretty good either way. But I made my decision just based on what I thought was probable and Honestly, just what I thought was going to look good. So, with all that being said, let's take a look and see how it actually turned out.
Okay, so there it is. And you can see what color scheme I chose, as if that wasn't already obvious. And, you know, look, I think it's a pretty defensible choice. I think it's actually pretty defensible to assert that this is um, the correct one. I mean, you could argue for the other one as well, but again, going back to the idea that it pretty much had to be green and brown coming out of the factory and that there was low likelihood of it getting a repaint as a training aircraft, again, I think that's, that's pretty plausible. I'm cool with it. Um, and the other thing that I think is pretty fascinating about it, or that fascinated me, obviously, is just how roached the thing was in the photographs that I have. I mean, those photographs necessarily don't cover a period of more than 18 months. And you can see how ass-whipped the thing was in those pictures. But especially interesting to me is in the first picture where it doesn't have any of the, of the stripes. So, you know, that had to be within the first few months, probably. Um, it, it was already starting to show lots of wear and tear. And I chose to try and replicate that as much as possible, even though, you know, the only view that we really have in the pictures is of the side of the fuselage and everything else is just kind of speculation. But we'll get into that in a minute. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the kit itself because I already have uh, one and a half parts of that where I discussed in detail. Um, but I'll just, you know, keep saying what I've said. This thing is fantastic. It's fun to build. The engineering is innovative, especially with the landing gear. I think it's the best landing gear of any model airplane kit I've ever seen. I hope they can figure out a way to do pretty much the same thing on anything they do in the future. And honestly, even though this might make uh, the guys at Kotare mad, I hope other kit manufacturers blatantly copy them. It's great. The only issues that I would say overall is that in a few places, the fit is a bit tight. If it weren't for that, the thing would be absolutely perfect in my opinion. It's just not quite there. Uh, you know, like, like say the Tamiya 132nd Spitfire is. But look, let's be honest, Tamiya has about 40 or 50 years more experience than the Kotari guys, even though the Kotari guys are also the Wingnut Wings guys, and they are obviously fantastic designers. The truth is that not only does Tamiya have an institutionalized engineering philosophy that you know, they've kept in place for many, many years and they've learned how to deal with tolerances. Part of what enables them to do that is the fact that they are much more vertically integrated. They, uh, I think, do their own tooling and they have their own injection molding plants, um, it, which makes a huge difference in terms of being able to control the process. You know, the Kotari guys, they got to go to China to work with the tool shop. They got to do it remotely, probably in a lot of cases. Same thing with the injection molding. And I can tell you, you know, from my own um, engineering product design experience working with injection molders and tool shops, it's a whole different deal when you're working with contractors as opposed to working with captive uh, parts of the organization. So, Look, these guys, they get mad, mad respect for doing this, as, doing such an amazing job with their with the first Kotari kit, even though, you know, it's not really their first thing, given the whole Wingnut Wings history. So, there's not a lot more to say about that. The only places where I really found some fit issues after the last video the one that really kind of did, you know, I'm going to say it ground my gears a little bit was right here around the edges of the back part of the canopy. Um, and, and to be fair, this is something that not a lot of people are going to run into because most are going to build it with it with the office door open. But I wanted to preserve the lines. And so I ran into this and you can even see right here. On this side, there was a significant gap, and I chose to just fill it 
using what I call the subtractive filling method where, you know, you put something in there like uh, Mr. Surfacer 1000 or Mr. Surfacer 500, um, or I think in this case, I chose to use uh, Tamiya uh, Epoxy Putty, something that you can smooth over with a solvent, like in that case, water. Um, and it, you know, it leaves a little bit of a telltale. I didn't want to get into sanding it because of these raised rivets right here. So it kind of is what it is. It was uh, not, not as bad on this side, but it still shows. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, but, you know, it's not horrible. It's not a deal breaker. Uh, I'm not too mad about it. The fit on the rest of the clear stuff was absolutely perfect. Really, really good. Otherwise, um, you know, there just, there just really were not any uh, challenges with the fit. Um, now, parts that I chose to uh, replace. I was originally going to build this thing completely out of the box. Um, when I got to the exhausts, I was like, well, okay. Um, you know, I glued them together and they're not too bad. But uh, even though you get a little bit of a dimple in the end there, you know, they were going to require some work. And Kotari themselves are printing accessory exhausts that are absolutely gorgeous. They sent me a couple of sets of them. I, I bought them. They sent me two sets, even though I only bought one. Thank you guys. Um, but they're, they're beautifully designed and beautifully printed. And you know, the tips of them are, are really, really the selling point. So I, you know, I just couldn't pass that up. The fit was a little bit tight. Um, I had to do a, a bit of um, of fettling uh, on the tabs. The engineering is great. Once you get the fit, and I wanted them to be loose enough that I could easily slide them in and out of there, uh, you know, as I worked on my, my painting. Um, and um, so I had to do a little bit of, of, of work on the tabs, but yeah, they, they're really just absolutely gorgeous. Love them. The other thing that I used, which I talked about in a previous video, were uh, the wheels from Tom Annie's. And uh, you'll just get to see them better maybe when I flip it over. But suffice it to say, um, they are gorgeous. Uh, Tom is a, is a great designer. And um, when you compare the detail with the kit uh, wheels, um, it's, it's not really much of a contest. I'm over here looking in this box to see if I still have the other pair of them uh, in here. And, and, I, and I don't. Um, but uh, no big deal. Uh, you can see the ones that I printed. And I talked about this in my previous video. But here's what the kit wheels look like. They fit uh, perfectly. Um, Kotari did exactly the right thing by making them keyed so that the flat spot uh, is, is in the correct orientation and they're handed. So you're not going to put the wrong wheel on the wrong side. And you've got a nicely raised Dunlop logo. You might say raised a little bit much. That's, you know, for scale. But look, this is the kind of thing where it needs to be a little over scale to make it sell and to make it easy to highlight that when you paint it. So it is what it is. And that was um, one of only two issues I had with, with Tom's wheels. And I talked about this in my other video. He chose to put the uh, lettering on in a much more scale thickness. And I grumbled at him about it. And, you know, we just had to kind of agree to disagree. <laughs> Um, as you'll see, I was able to get some dry brushing on them, but it honestly was harder than it needed to be. Even if these were 50% were taller, um, or even 100% taller, they wouldn't stick out an offensively large amount, and they just would be easier to work with. So, come on, Tom. Anyway, the only other issue was that when I printed them, the tolerances were just too tight. And I couldn't even really get the uh, the rim, the wheel in the tire um, easily, and uh, so Tom sent me a set of his, 
and his printer is a bit better than mine and the definition on the letters was better and the tolerances were better but I still ended up having to do just a little bit of uh, sanding on the inside of the tire because what I wanted was to be able to put the wheel on the tip of the landing gear first then put the tire on it set the model down so that the tires would be oriented correctly with the flat spot uh, because his uh, wheels and tires are not clocked to get the correct orientation. And then add a little bit of, of thin super glue in there to secure it. Actually, I did it with, with five-minute epoxy, which is uh, really good for doing stuff like wheels where you need a minute to, to work, uh, or five minutes. Um, so anyway, that, that, but that was all fine. It all worked out fine, and I'm really happy with the way that the, that the wheels and tires turned out. The only other sort of issue is... And I talked to Tom about this, and, and, and he, we both were kind of scratching our heads because he has in, the wheels on a Spitfire are, are, are cambered out uh, at the top. When you look at it from the front, you can see that. And he has that camber built into these wheels. And I was like, but Tom, uh, it's built in already to the landing gear. Uh, it has to be because this slot has to be molded straight in in order for it to be able to come out of the tool. And so if you've got an angle included in your wheels as well as the angle on the landing gear from the kit, you may be getting twice as much angle. I don't know. Still not very much, and I think it still looks fine. Um, the kit wheels actually almost touch the landing gear and they seem like they might be a little too tight and so you can see down in there that there's clearance and uh, it looks authentic and they're both and the important thing is that they're both the same on each side because the engineering is really good uh, you get I had to take a little bit off the tabs on the landing gear to get them to slide off and on um, easily but but they're great and they're tight. They're not even glued on right now. And the landing gear is not even glued in. It's just, you know, I was able to sneak up on the fit with a little bit of file work well enough that it's snug uh, just the way it is. Same thing with the tail wheel. Love it. I mean, look, if you don't need to use glue, you don't need to use glue. Uh, my only other issue uh, aside from that was uh, with the uh, rudder mount for the aerial wire, which I used thin easy line for that. Um, and I, look, I, this, this is not a, a knock on Kotari in particular because all of the kit manufacturers make this mistake and it is a mistake in my opinion. And that is not making this mount for the uh, aerial a separate molded piece, especially on 132nd, where it would be super easy to do to have a hole in the top of the, of the rudder and have this as a separate piece um, that you could put in at the end. I tried to avoid snapping it off by not putting the rudder on um, until the end. And because of the way the rudder is so beautifully engineered, it's got a giant tab right here in the middle that slides into the back of this part of the fuselage, I could take it off and on as much as I wanted to for painting and weathering, and that was great. But I still managed to snap this off and I had to remanufacture it. And I did that by um, uh, soldering together a couple of pieces of 0.6 millimeter nickel silver tubing. I used solder paste, I set it up on my little anvil, I taped everything up. It took me a few tries, honestly, to get it right. And I then, and I did it where I had about an inch uh, uh, on each uh, leg, and then I trimmed it using a little abrasive cutoff wheel in my Proxon, taped it down, trimmed it off, and uh, it came out great. And, and then there's a pin in the bottom of it that goes down into the hole that I drilled in the, uh, the, the, the top of the, of the rudder, which was a little bit of a, of a trick to, to drill that hole there. But 
Not nearly as much of a trick. Hang on, my camera's coming loose here, getting all crazy. Um, it was not nearly as much of a trick as drilling a hole in the little flag on the uh, on the on the mast, uh, but I had to do it. Um, and I already had a hole drilled here in the fuselage. They tell you in the instructions to do that. And so by the time I got everything in place, I was able to string the aerial mast through this uh, even before I put the mast in. And I got the mast installed. And once the glue set. I poked uh, the, uh, this end of it into the hole, added a little bit of extra thin cyanoacrylate. Once that's set, I inserted the other end into this tube and pulled it all the way through, put a little bit of tension on it, added a little CA there, and then just chopped the tail of it off. And it was, at that point, super easy and came out super clean. Easy line. You know, it's frustrating because it's actually flat and you can kind of see that as it twists it gets a little thick, thin, thick, thin, uh, but you know, it is what it is. There are some other stretchy elastic threads out there that uh, work as well, but yeah, easy lines what I got. So anyway, um, that is, uh, that's, that's that as far as the kit itself goes. Oh, I did add, um, they have the, uh, the wheels down indicators. Uh, the, the position for them, they have a hole uh, molded in the top of the wing. And <laughs> I was seriously looking at reference photos to see if I could get away without putting those on. And yeah, I, I couldn't. They're there. It's a thing. And uh, so I just uh, used some pieces of uh, 0.45 millimeter uh, or point, let's see, what is it? 0.5 millimeter nickel silver tubing. Um, cut at an angle, uh, put a little super glue in the end of it to cap it off and stuck them in there and painted them. And uh, I, I think that even though it seemed like it was going to be a real hassle when I was doing it, that it actually was not that hard and it's a high value detail. I really, really like that. So um, at any rate, that's everything other than the uh, landing gear control that I talked about in a previous uh, video that's in the cockpit to uh, help bring this thing up to late production spec as opposed to the mid production spec. So anyway, that's it for the kit. Lovely, wonderful. I, I just, I can't say enough about how much fun this was. It was exactly what I needed to kind of sort of revive my model making mojo and get back to my happy place of 132nd scale World War II single engine fighters and the weathering thereof. And so now uh, let me just talk for a few minutes hopefully about the paint and the weathering. Not going to go into huge detail because it's covered in other videos and I basically have not done anything here that's different, although I sort of adjusted some techniques uh, because I had some goals in mind. My, one of my overarching goals was to not only just try and really uh, reflect the absolutely ass-whipped condition of the aircraft that showed in the photos, but to sort of tell the story that, look, there's a training aircraft. It's like the, you know, it's, it's like the forgotten stepchild. It, it does, doesn't get a lot of, it gets a lot of use, but not a lot of attention kind of a thing, which I feel like is probably pretty plausible for something in, you know, that, that situation. Um, but I also wanted to, I, I've always been searching for that, 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 sort of intersection between authenticity and drama and looks cool. And that's what I was continuing to search for here. Kind of like a Steve McCurry portrait. If you've never looked him up, check him out. He's, he's one of the iconic American color photographers. His photographs are rich, bold, colorful, strong, but they don't look cartoonish. And that's, that's the feel that I want. And so, yeah, maybe a little more drama 
but not where you look at it and go, that's just silly looking or not realistic. And I don't know, maybe some people are gonna think this is silly looking, but it's the look that I was going for. And so um, I, I wanted to do that, and I also wanted to do as much weathering as possible with acrylic ink. And so, um, and to try to get away from as much pre-shading. So basically with this thing, I laid down gray Mr. Surfacer 1500 and uh, I sprayed the uh, MRP Super Silver where I was going to have chipping, applied hairspray, and then did all of my uh, top colors pretty much solid. Did not do much of any uh, sort of pre-shading. I did a little bit in the areas or like around these gun doors, but... Um, I just didn't I just didn't fool with it. I sprayed solid colors and looked more to all of my post shading and more specifically the ink work to get the tonal variety that I was after and even some of the specific weathering effects like all of this, you know, tracked on uh, grime around the gun doors um, and the sort of dirty uh, appearance of the uh, of the, of the of these insignia, and the way that I do that is I'm using Liquitex acrylic ink that's reduced a lot, like 80 to 90 percent with X20A. X20A is the one reducer I've found that works for all of the Liquitex colors, but most importantly for white because to get these dirt tones, I use white mixed with uh, like raw umber for the most part and uh, works really, really good, and I'm applying it with a sponge. Uh, I just take the sponge, dip it in the ink, put it on a paper towel to get most of it off, and then just start stippling. And if it doesn't give me the look that I want right away, then I'll go back with a second sponge that I dip only in X20A. I get rid of most of it on a paper towel, and then I'll go back and I'll start working that. And not only does that give me a lot of control, um, you know, I'm using the sponge and a pair of gripper tweezers, but uh, it, because Liquitex will wash off with 409, I know I've talked about this before, um, if I screw it up, I can just scrub it off and start over. And that's, you know, um, I can't overstate how important that is in terms of having the confidence to just try things. So... Pretty much everything you see is achieved using inks, except for the uh, panel lines are enamels and oils. Um, again, trying to get the colors to be, um, you know, complements of the base color. So I've got black Tamiya panel line wash in the areas where it's a, you know, like a door that comes off or a surface that moves like the, uh, the flap indicator uh, door. Then in the uh, browns, I used the Tamiya Brown panel line wash. And in the greens, I mixed some using Windsor & Newton oils. And a little trick that I learned that somebody on SMCG brought up, I think it was Stuart Halton. It's a great trick that I kind of was like, God damn, how did I not ever think of that before? One of my chief irritations, I, I mean, panel lines drive me crazy because I love the way they look, but, um, you know, getting them right is just an exercise of OCD level frustration for me. And one of the reasons is because when I'm trying to get a, a separate color, you know, the one color runs into the other. And what I would do to mitigate that is, like, I did all of the brown tones first, like all the way, even including, you know, all of, most all of this uh, weathering effect. Then before I put a clear coat on, I applied the panel line wash and I sealed that in using a layer of MRP Super Clear Matte so that at a minimum, when I got to the greens, if the green panel line wash ran over here on top of the brown, which it inevitably would do, I could at least use a brush with mineral spirits to clean it off and not affect the brown underneath. But then came this other trick that's even better, and that's using a little bit of masking fluid in the panel line to block it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, duh. 
And and once I mean, and once that's dry, then just put the panel line in. And once the panel line is good the way you want it, you just pop that little bit of masking fluid off and boom, it's perfect. I, I mean, it's great. I, I, I can't even, uh, yeah, let's like, like simultaneously stoked at a new technique and mad at all the time I've wasted in previous projects messing with panel lines, trying to get them perfect. Anyway, the other part of this is oils, uh, like right here on the gun doors because for a smooth, soft stain, there's just no substitute for oils. The way that they blend and are just so soft, it's just, it's perfect. And I wanted to really highlight the fact that um, Spitfires have a unique thing with the way that the guns are serviced in that they open these doors on the top and then there's dudes underneath and those doors come completely off. And so when I flip it over, you'll see uh, the weathering uh, underneath there. So there's that. Um, another weathering technique that somebody persuaded me to try that I, I really love, Shane Doak, I owe him the mad props for shit talking me into trying this because frankly, I was a little scared. But uh, you guys know that part of how I achieve this sort of faded look is with very fine sanding. I use a little bit of Infini sanding sponge and gripper tweezers. The 1500 or the 1000 grit, 1500 is really my preference, does a great job, it's super controllable, and it'll start to highlight anything that's a little tall. And so any texture you've got um, will get picked up from the white base coat that's underneath here, and, and you get this, this look. But, it's hard to control it around something as small as, let's say, a, uh, a bolt head or a fastener like this. And so what Shane does is he uses decal softening fluid as a, as a, as a softening agent on a Q-tip to just kind of rub around that. And there's just enough mild alcohol, and, I, and, he, and, and he recommended trying Solvacet, so that's what I used. There's just enough mild alcohol in that that you can, you know, pretty controllably start working that, and it'll allow you to remove just the top layer gradually enough to get that worn through the paint look. And I love it. It's a great technique, but you do have to be careful because you are messing with solvents. And while you're gonna get uh, you know, enough control to do something like that right there, it can get out of hand in a hurry. You know, Ask me how I know. Um, and you can end up doing some damage that you don't wanna do. So you, you know, I, would ex I would recommend experimenting, testing like always um, to, to find the right, uh, you know, combination I found that the uh, that, that, that the q-tips that worked best for me were like these uh, these ones right here and I would use the pointy end but be careful a q-tip that's too hard it'll get away from you so anyway that's that all right so um, one other thing that I did that I thought was kind of cool was how did I solve the challenge of painting these stripes on the spinner? You know, there's lots of ways to go about it. Um, what I chose to do was, yep, I used my 3D printing and CAD skills <laughs> and I made a mask. So I sprayed uh, the whole thing white and then I used uh, this, uh, this mask first, you can see it goes on from the end and I use that to spray the, the blue. Um, and then I flipped it around and this one, this mask goes on the other way like this. And it's a nice tight fit and I've got a nice sharp edge inside there and that enabled me to spray the red. So um, it gave me the white base coat under the whole thing. 
that I was going to want not only to make the colors pop, but to let me do a little bit of that sanding weathering that I've that I was talking about before. So. Um, I'm pretty stoked with the way that that came out. The striping on this thing, it's just, you know, you, I don't know, when I look at the photos, it seems like the whoever laid it out didn't really think it through. It's like they looked at it and said, oh, let's put an 18 inch stripe right down the top of the middle of the nose and start with that and just work our way around. And what they found, as you'll see when I, I mean, as you can see from the photos is that when you look at it from the side, the stripes are just kind of goofy looking because of the shape of the Spitfire's nose. And yeah, you know, it is what it is. I was not gonna correct it. I just went with it the way that it was. Um, it, I don't know, it kind of adds to the charm. It's, it's, it's badly done, but that's, that's, that's what it was. So speaking of the nose and the exhaust, this is where I got into um, a little bit more uh, multimedia weathering because um, one of the things with Spitfires is that they always have this characteristic exhaust stain that is shaped by the airflow over the wing. But Mark 1s are a bit different from the later ones because of how far the exhaust stacks stick out. So you'll get this characteristic um, staining of the tips of the of the stacks that you know varies as you go towards the back but you don't get as much staining on the fuselage but I wanted a little bit I mean it's there you can see it in real photos even with with restored aircraft but it's not as dramatic as it is on the later marks of Spitfires and so what I did was um, I, I made a template, and I don't still have it, uh, but uh, I just, I, 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 I designed it uh, using the Sketcher in Fusion 360, uh, brought it over into Affinity Designer, printed it, um, and uh, out of some uh, relatively heavy photo paper. And so I had a template that I stuck to the side of the whole aircraft, with um, poster tack that I was able to spray through with a very uh, light sort of smoke color, kind of a very light gray brown. And that established the basic shape all the way back. And that's a technique that I really like. The poster tack holds it away from the surface enough that you get a soft edge. And again, because I was using ink, if I didn't like it, I could just wash it off and start over, which I did quite a few times. For some reason, this side fought me, and it took me half a dozen tries to get the dark part of the stain, which is what I started with, to have the density and the curved shape that I really wanted. For whatever reason, it was a lot easier on this side, but uh, once I had that, then I came back and I did the lighter part, um, and then I sealed all that in with MRP Super Clear Matte, and I did a little bit of oil work and sponge work to get, uh, you know, what you see here. These stains that show leakage from the, from the fuel tank um, are uh, oils. And I tried to uh, show not only the angle, because the aircraft is sitting, you know, on its wheels, but also how it kind of washes through the exhaust stain here. Um, and um, I'm pretty pleased with the way that that turned out. Just kind of show the way that it collects there in the panel lines. Anyway, so that that that's that really covers most of it. Oh, one other thing that I really got to talk about is how I painted all the markings. Obviously, um, I cut my own masks from Aura Mask 810 for the lettering. And one of the things that I wanted to try to achieve. If you've looked at the photos or whatever and you've noticed that this E is really wonky, look at the black and whites of the actual aircraft. That E is goofy looking and, and I don't know why. Again, just badly painted. And I had to try and replicate that um, is the, as far as the other side goes. I went with less goofy but still a little different than these letters. Uh, you know, again. That's just the way it was. Um, something else that, that you can see in the historic photos 
is that for some reason, in addition to having the serial number here, they had added it into the fin flash. I don't know why, but it was a thing, so I made my own mask for that as well. Now, the uh, large, the big stuff, the roundels, they came out of the uh, mask set that I bought from One Man Army, um, but I did not buy them for that reason. I bought them because, uh, as I talked about in one of my randoms videos, One Man Army, which is a neat little company uh, out of Belgium, is making these amazingly cool laser cut masks that include stencils. And there you can see more of them. They are phenomenal. Like if there was a product of the year thing for scale modeling, these would be it. Although I think it would probably be last year, maybe year before last. At any rate, this guy has figured out the secret sauce for his laser cutter and working with this washi masking material to be able to do these masks. And they are super well designed. You can see you even get extras. They're, they're, they're just absolutely fantastic. They're a little spendy, but the product and the packaging is fantastic. This was easily worth the 45 bucks that it cost me honestly, just for those stencils, because obviously no decal film whatsoever. And so, you know, for stuff like the uh, Popjoy Aero Motor insignia on the rudder, um, I mean, dude, it's just so cool. Is this actually a Popjoy rudder? I don't know, but we don't have pictures of that side of the airplane to be able to tell and it was certainly a thing, so yeah, I like it. The other thing that painting them enables you to do that I absolutely adore is the ability to sand them to reflect the abrasion the way that they, would, that they get weathered. And you can see that um, here where I've got the, um, the walkway forward markings pretty well uh, worn down because they get, you know, walked on anyway. Same thing over here with the walkway inboard uh, lettering, but then right here, not so much because hopefully not getting stepped on. And uh, they, they just work great. Um, you know, they're a little bit of time spent to do the masking because you gotta add masking tape all around for overspray. And, you know, but I just approached it by, you know, I would do, you know, like a certain little set of them at, a, at, at multiple bench uh, sessions. And so it really didn't end up being too bad. Um, and for me, the, the effort was absolutely worth, uh, I mean, the result was just absolutely worth the effort. No question about it. I'll use these wherever I, I get the chance. Um, and, and But one thing I will say is, part of what makes these work is using good paint. You really need a, a material that has high density, that, but that still goes on thin. And so uh, for that, I really feel like even if you normally want to shoot acrylics, do all your base colors in acrylics, but get you some MRP black to do these stencils because it really is helpful. It's perfect for spraying those right out of the bottle. And you just really have to sneak up on it. Like I actually uh, would, would, would shoot these letters in uh, three layers to just really sneak, it up, sneak up on it to get the density that I wanted but not get it so thick that you know, you'd see it sticking up from the surface. Okay, so um, the next thing, the last thing I really want to talk about with the weathering um, is all the chipping because that's a thing, you know, Spitfires have this characteristic sort of triangular shaped wear effect, at least on the uh, port side, sometimes on the starboard side as well. I purposefully showed much less of it over here 
just as a differentiator because the port side is where the pilot uh, boards and you have most of your you know crew activity for fueling and so forth um, and that's my character my, my characteristic um, method where I do most of it with a tiny piece of the same sanding sponge that I was talking about before only I use it dipped in water and that gives me a lot better control than just attacking it with a brush I'll do some of it with a brush but most of this was done with the sanding sponge and especially because I wanted to be able to show things like this sharp edge where you know you just get a differentiator between the paint and a place that's maybe a little bit more raised and gets just a little bit more abrasion that's a very common thing and when you look at Spitfire wingwear photos you'll see this characteristic pattern where it's either got rivets or maybe there's ribs underneath there and it's a little stiffer and so those areas get a little bit more abrasion and they show up like that but it's not molded in detail in the Kotari kit. I wish it was, but it's not there. And so I really just kind of had to look at photos and approximate that. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I really love 132nd scale uh, for this, because that type of effect takes a lot of control. A little tiny skinny piece of sanding sponge just working it very carefully and you have to be careful because if you're only going in one direction you'll get directional scratches that will easily show up so a sort of a circular motion but obviously a tiny tiny circular motion to be able to create a, a pattern like that but I, again to me it's it's worth the effort I feel like this is kind of peak chipping for me I don't I don't I don't know that I've ever managed to pull off anything better. Um, you know, the way that it crawls up the side of the fuselage there, you see that in photos. Um, I just, I'm happy with it. Some people will notice if they look really close that it's kind of multi-layer here because of the colors. That honestly was a little bit of a happy accident because of overspray from the sky on the belly. And I, but I decided, you know what, that's actually pretty plausible. Spitfire wings were painted separate from the fuselage and then bolted on later. And so it's easy to imagine there's no reason, even though they did mask a hard edge at the middle of the, of the leading edge, at least on early Spitfires, there's no reason to believe they would mask the, the belly color if they sprayed that first or vice versa. But I, you know, I sprayed the belly color first and then when I did the chipping, I got this sort of multi-layer effect where that sky shows through and I love it. I think it looks really cool and authentic. So that's what happened there. Okay, so I think that's uh, pretty much it for the top. I am going to attempt to flip this over without wrecking it and we'll take a look at whatever's going on underneath. Okay, so we survived that, and the bottom really is just more of the same in terms of, of techniques. This is all, uh, everything going on with these, with these panels is all uh, uh, sprayed um, ink, and, um, and then the same with the, you know, with the masks that I talked about before. I was really happy with the way that these, these powder burns came out. Now some of you might say, wait a minute, this training aircraft, why are you getting you know, gun powder stains? And I actually talked to Richard Alexander about this and I asked him straight up if he thought that an aircraft from an operational training unit would even have guns. And he said, oh yeah, absolutely. Because not only are the guys that flew these gonna wanna maybe get a little bit of target practice, but the ground crew and the armorers are also practicing their jobs at an OTU. So there's going to be gun servicing. And so I chose to just go ahead and, and depict that. It's, you know, very characteristic with Spitfires. I love it. There's lots of belly shots of Spitfires that show this characteristic weathering. And I love it. The other thing that I wanted to do was really kind of have a lot of dirty uh, drama in the middle. The bottom of a Spitfire fuselage is a filthy and busy place between the dirt that gets spewed up from the, uh, the wheels, 
uh, and the oil that leaks out, I, you get a lot of stuff going on. So I started with the dirt, and again, this was stippled and airbrushed ink. Um, and somebody said, uh, look, this looks, you know, excessive. Okay, so let me, let me say two things about that. One is this got away from me a little bit because I just made a, a stupid mistake and I, that I, I know better. I spent a lot of time with the first pass at the dirt, stippling with the sponge. And I was pretty happy with it and I just decided to go ahead and lock it in with a layer of MRP Super Clear Matte immediately. And it was late at night. I should have waited till the next day because when I came and looked at it the next day, I thought, damn, that's a little bit too orange. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that it was implausible. It's just that I just didn't, I didn't like the color balance. It was a little too orange. Um, everything else about it, I was happy with, which was, an, which was a bummer because at that point, with it covered in clear lacquer, there was no rewinding. And I, I should have just waited. I think what happens is that when you're really working in close for a long period of time, your eyeballs kind of get numb to the tones and you may not realize that it's going in the wrong direction until it happens. And to be clear, I didn't hate it. It just wasn't exactly what I wanted. So I spent a lot of effort trying to correct that tone and getting it to a cooler brown. And so inevitably that ended up in a little bit more buildup than I had really planned. But I actually kind of love it. I mean, it's dramatic, no doubt, but it's not implausible. Somebody said, oh, these aircraft didn't fly when it was muddy. Well, that's just nonsense. And I've got plenty of photos in my reference library that show aircraft being prepped for flight in standing mud and water. And as a farm guy, I can tell you it does not take very much of that for this kind of buildup to occur. So it's not implausible. If it's, if, you know, if it's not to your taste, okay. But that's different than it didn't happen like that. Okay, the other thing that's really characteristic with Spitfires, especially early Merlins, is this massive amount of leaking and streaking. And that happens not only because they were, you know, a bit leaky motors. I mean, look, come on, Rolls-Royce Merlins were hand-built, so a eh, little leaky. But also, there's an oil tank on this firewall uh, right, uh, you know, above this area right here. And so, uh, being, you know, filled with oil, there's going to be dripping and spilling, etc., and it's going to come out down here. And that's why you get this hard separation at these panel lines, which I think is just super cool. So I did my usual streaking where I mixed up a very dark brown black mixture um, and just started working from these edges. And I did use some masking tape just to make life easier. But um, after I was done, I went back with some mineral spirits and cleaned that up to give me a hard separation. To get them straight, it's my trick that I've talked about before, where I use a ruler. Um, in this case, I use the edge of a sanding sponge, but anything will work, um, as a guide for my brush to get that, you know, perfectly straight look. Some of these streaks would probably have been a little bit more curved because of the airflow around, like the, you know, the radiator and the oil cooler, but they're mostly straight. And so I was really happy with the way that those turned out. Um, it, a lot of work, but again, it's one of those things. You know, the belly of an aircraft is just a brutal irony for me. Um, it's, it's my favorite part. It's where all the really interesting and fun shit happens in terms of weathering. And you kind of have to pay attention to the belly of an aircraft because unlike any other vehicle, you know, it's a thing. Like it, it potentially is, is gonna show uh, but it doesn't really get seen the way, you know, that the top side does. So, yeah, it's a bit of a frustrating irony, but I can't resist it. I love working on the underside, and uh, yeah, it's a thing. So, anyway, I think that pretty well covers it all. Okay, so, yeah, that's it. That is the story of this little project. 
I, this is exactly what I needed. I had been suffering from lack of motivation. Uh, the truth is, you know, that I'm, I'm getting older. My spinal cord injury is catching up with me a little bit more. And it's getting tougher to do this stuff. Um, but I had also just honestly been kind of doing things over the last couple of years for some of the wrong reasons. I mean, they were my choices, don't get me wrong, but, you know, doing some of the things that I've done over the last couple of years was kind of sucking the joy out of it for me. And I needed to really get back to my happy place. And one thirty-second scale single engine World War II fighters are where it's at for me. It's not that I won't ever do anything else uh, or that I don't love other things, but this is just absolutely my favorite. And this Kotari kit was the perfect way to get back to that. It also was fun, uh, and I got and I owe a big shout out to Richard Alexander himself, um, the honcho at Kotari, because I mean I was bugging the shit out of him via private messaging, asking him questions about colors and details. And he was just super cool and patient with me. And I really appreciate it, Richard. You're awesome. I don't know that there's anybody who knows more about Spitfires on the planet. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, that I did this project justice both to you and your love of Spitfires as well as to the gang at, at Kotari. Um, it, it's a wonderful kit. You guys are doing great stuff. I also want to highlight Richard's books. He's done a couple of these wing leader books, and they're fantastic. Not only are they just a fun format with lots of big, uh, crisp photos, but you know, you've know you got Richard's knowledge in there, and um, they were really invaluable. If you love Spitfires, if you're a Spitfire uh, model maker, you gotta go buy both of them. They're just great. So anyway, that's it, that's that. Um, if you guys have followed this project along the way, I really appreciate it, and as always, much love.